Good morning. Hello. Hi, Megan, uh, my and viewers and listeners. My name is M. Alves. I am the Violence Prevention Education Coordinator at the Phoenix Center at Auraria. Uh, and welcome to the inaugural episode of the Phoenix Cast. Yay! <laughs> um, we're really excited to be here. Um, and so I'll tell you, I'll just say a little bit more about myself. Um, my background is as a social worker um, specializing in violence and injury prevention among women and femmes of color. Um, and I have been at the Phoenix Center for almost a year at this point, and I'm really, really excited about this new project. Um, I'm going to let Megan Cullen introduce herself now. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Megan Cullen. I am the director of the Phoenix Center at Auraria. Um, I have been serving in this role for three and a half years, just about now, uh, <clears throat> which is amazing. And I'm super glad to, to be here and also definitely excited about this, this whole idea. Nice job, Em. Um, and what about me? So my background is in psychology and counseling. Um, I've been working in violence prevention and response for about 10 years in the community as well as with the military um, and now in higher ed. Um, and I have a munchkin, which is why I'm here. <laughs> Awesome. Yes. So today we're going to be talking about comprehensive sexuality education. So this is something, this is a topic that's really, really important, really dear to the hearts of, uh, I would say, pretty much everyone who works at the PCA, uh, because we know how important sex ed generally is. So we're going to talk a little bit about this in particular because this year we actually started a workshop called Comprehensive Sexuality Education, Leveling the Playing Fields and Implications for Violence Prevention. So even though sex education may not seem totally related to prevention work, to, to people outside the field of uh, violence prevention, I would say, um, there's definitely a huge tie there. I think uh, it was never, you know, it was always the talk, right, when I was a kid. Um, and it was never like tied to prevention and it was never um, introduced to me as comprehensive sexuality education until I was in this work. Can you remind me what is like the official definition of comprehensive sex ed? Yeah, so um, this is the definition that I have gotten from um, Advocates for Youth, which is in a really, really amazing organization that um, as the name suggests, uh, does a lot of advocating for youth and for issues that affect youth um, throughout their lifetime uh, and have long-term effects, right? So lack of comprehensive sex ed would be one of them. So um, their definition states that comprehensive sex education uh, teaches about abstinence as the best method for avoiding STDs and unintended pregnancy, but also teaches about condoms and contraceptions mm -hmm. um, to reduce the risk of unintended pregnancy and of infection with STDs. And it also teaches young people interpersonal communication skills and helps young people explore their own values, goals, and options and teaches sexuality as a natural, normal, healthy part of life that you can choose to engage in. So it sounds like it's not one or the other, right? Like often we see in traditional sex education, especially the kind that's you know, provided in schools that it's sort of one or the other, right? It's like silver ring thing, abstinence only, you're a dirty shoe. <laughs> or, it's like, or it's like, hey, here's this very clinical understanding of like, what are STIs? And how do you like have safe sex? Um, safe of, in that situation, of course, being preventing STIs and preventing pregnancy to the best of their ability. Um, but it sounds like the newest movement of comprehensive sex ed is really about engaging everything and really honoring like here are all of the choices that you can make let us help you make an informed choice which of course is near and dear to the hearts of social workers and advocates everywhere <laughs> absolutely absolutely and that's what i really love about comp sex ed especially because as you said um you know there was something in there that you said that kind of uh shows the way that mm -hmm. we have uh, really unequal education depending on your zip code for instance so like most people receive sex ed in their school if they receive sex ed right, right. so and then if they receive sex ed it what kind is it abstinence only and so that's why I really love this um, 
this movement because it really is, as you said, comprehensive and it's something that our own state is trying to make sure is more available because medically accurate mm. um, sex ed is vital. It yeah. is uh, a protective factor for kids It's uh, and it keeps young folks healthy and safe. Mm -hmm. um, and what I really like about comp sex ed is also the um, really the focus on relationships too. So it's also about mm -hmm. communication and it doesn't always feel like that communication is just within the confines of the sexual relationship. So I really, really like that as well. So it's, it's mm -hmm. in these interpersonal, um, these interpersonal communication skills that realistically we don't actually teach mm -mm. Um, anywhere. So no, it's funny, right? So you know that like on the side, I do private practice work, right? As a therapist. And I do a lot of work with couples and it's, astonishing to me. I feel like every single time they're, I mean, very smart humans. Um, but we have to like go back to basics of like, what is communication and what are your boundaries and like all these different things, because you're absolutely right. You know, most of us learn prior to this kind of education. Most of us learn about relationships from our parents, which is a good thing or it's a real bad thing. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And so, and that's another thing that uh, it, that's another thing that I think leads to inequity, right? So one, no one is getting the same um, sex ed. And two, people have all kinds of different um, family situations that they're living in, right? And so they may have never seen what a healthy, loving relationship looks yeah. like. And then there are families who, you know, they're really great at communication and they're able to set up those examples, <clears throat> but it shouldn't be that easy for, for our young folks to fall behind. Mm -hmm. There needs yeah. to be uh, safety nets, and our school system is supposed to provide some of those safety nets. Absolutely, and I think one thing I wanted to point out about what you said that I think um, is fascinating and, and horrifying, to be honest, um, is the fact that so few states require medically accurate sex education. Like, there are some states in the United States where you can just, like, make some things up <laughs> and, like, that's fine. And I don't like, it's just, it boggles my mind every time I think about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so that's actually um, something that Colorado addressed. I think I may have briefly mentioned it, but the specific yeah. bill um, that the Colorado legislature introduced and was passed this past year actually, um, mm -hmm. was targeting the the unequal um, information or like the lack of medically accurate information being provided yeah. in schools. So any school that receives state funding um, mm -hmm. and teaches sex ed now has to, like they are required to provide comprehensive um, sexuality education. Awesome. So this isn't saying that every school has to do sex ed, though I would love that and I really hope <laughs> where we're going. What it is saying is that if you, if your school makes the decision to provide this information and you receive funding, mm -hmm. you are required to provide all of the options, medically accurate, representative of your student body. So that means including LGBTQ students and including mm -hmm. disabled students, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and we know that in, uh, representation within our educational system and within every every system is mm -hmm. vital to the mental health uh, effects that people experience later on in life. So if we want folks to have good mental health, we need to let them know that they're seen mm -hmm. starting from infancy, really. Yeah, for real. Well, I think it's interesting, right? Because after this bill passed, I know that there were a lot of folks who didn't I don't think super understood what the bill was going for and what it was trying to accomplish. And then like the like sort of fear mongering started. And I feel like the fear mongering started around like, you're going to talk to my five-year-old about sex. Um, no, <laughs> um, there is absolutely a way to talk about the tenets of comprehensive sex education or to build it in such a way that you start talking about the things that are really generalizable, um, that then when they are at an appropriate age to talk about actual se sexual activity, you can take the lessons that they've been learning since they were five years old and go, hey, remember that thing that we taught you that had nothing to do with sex? Let's apply it now over here. And how much more effective that is as an education tool, as opposed to, for instance, the first time that they hear the word consent is when they're 12 or 13 that 
then you have this huge steep learning curve that they have to somehow learn at the same time that they're trying to balance all of the different things that they're experiencing and all of the changes that they're going through when it comes to puberty and like, oh, I'm also noticing the people that I may be attracted to. And like, then they're trying to jumble this understanding at the same time. It's just too much. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Yeah. You need to build up those skills. And then right. so as a culture, we never talk about sex. We never really talk about relationships um, except for fly baby bird, get out the nest. You just, it's going to happen. Right. And we okay. see the harm that that does. Well, um, I, you know, what? I wish I remembered the number exactly. Um, but I remember that there is a study out there that shows that like some astronomical percentage of male presenting and identifying individuals indicated that they learned the most about sex from pornography, which is like, yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> um, I mean, there are so many things wrong with that, not because pornography necessarily is wrong, but because it doesn't often depict reality, mm -hmm. right? And then you have these people, specifically in this study, male identified and presenting folks, um, who are going into sexual relationships thinking that that's realistic, or thinking that that's normal, or thinking that consent is just implied, and you don't ever have to talk about it, and like, it's weird or awkward to talk about it when it's really not. Totally. Yeah. There's no, there's no consent. And then for folks who are interested in kink stuff, there's no like negotiation right. of what that looks like in porn. And then yeah. something that even like I just thought of right now is uh, whenever anal is, is depicted in porn, there's no like prep. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it requires a lot of prep. And if you don't know, right. you can really hurt yourself or someone yeah. that you're with. Yeah. And so like that also becomes like a huge issue of um, unintended violence, right? Like you're, you're using this as an educational tool. You're thinking, oh, this is how it works. Mm -hmm. And then you go to put that in practice mm -hmm. and you, no one's ever told you how to have a conversation with your partner about like some of those yeah. statistics. Mm -hmm. Neither of you are maybe wanting to do that. And then you end up in a situation where you're hurt intentionally or not. Yeah. Well, and I think it's, you know, you talk about things like power dynamics as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, did I talk over you? No, no. Um, just clarifying that in this situation, like showing kind of like the unintentional, uh, yes. uh, like harms of porn. Sure. Um, it's Zoom. <laughs> the reality of our lives. <laughs> Um, I was going to say, you know, similarly to if you see any kind of power dynamic um, in pornography, I think that can really, if you don't have it set up appropriately or you don't have the, tech, the, con the context, right, it starts to look, I mean, it feeds rape culture really in a lot of ways, right, because there isn't, as you said, any of that conversation of negotiation, this is what I'm okay with, this is what I'm not, this is the kind of like dynamic that, you know, I'm looking for in this experience, but, you know, these are the things that are off limits. Like, those are very specific conversations when you're talking about any kind of kink that has to do with power dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, and those are nowhere, but I, we could talk about pornography forever, and that is not what we're here to talk about. <laughs> That's another episode. <laughs> yes. Stay um, tuned for more. <laughs> Um, but in that vein, I did want to hear kind of, um, I heard you use the term age appropriate when it comes mm. to com sex ed. And so yeah. I know that you've done some work, um, around age appropriate versus developmentally appropriate. Mm. And I kind of want to yeah. talk to you a little bit about what are some of the pitfalls in, um, and benefits of, uh, the differences in those terms. Yeah. So I think, um, you're talking about the work that I did with intellectually um, differently abled folks, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, I am 100% not an expert. So I want to really like name that real fast. Um, if any of our listeners or viewers are, please feel free um, to comment and correct me. I, you know, this is my formed opinion based on limited amount of work that I've done um, and some research. So checking that real fast. <laughs> um, I think it's important to remember age appropriate versus developmentally appropriate, right? So age generally refers to chronological age, right? How many years do you have on this earth outside of a womb, right? That's, that's your chronological age. And then your developmental age is more um, what general age range are you in line with the way that, with the way that you engage with and understand the world, right? And when we start talking about folks who have um, differing abilities or understandings based on developmental disability or intellectual disabilities, um, you kind of have to do an interesting mix, right? Because they're 
ability to understand or to comprehend may be different from their chronological age. Um, however, their, their physical bodies and their secondary sex characteristics and puberty and all of those hormones that rush through our brains and make us like ridiculous people um, <laughs> for a number of years, those don't have anything to do, to my knowledge, with that intellectual disability, right? So you, you have this person who, for instance, maybe engages with the world at, let's say, a fourth grade level, right? But their body is very, very much, let's say, 18, right? And these are numbers I've picked out of thin air. <laughs> so you kind of have to um, meld those understandings. So you have to explain things in a way that's very clear, um, very direct, um, concise in a certain way, right? Because if you think about um, folks in that fourth grade age range, let's say, the, the nuance isn't quite there, right? So you really have to stay away from uh, innuendo or like anything that expects anyone to read between the lines, stay away from, <laughs> right? Um, and you have to be clear in explaining. Um, you also have to be clear in ensuring that you are not breeding shame, right? Um, this is your body. This is what it does. This might feel good. This might not. This, you know, all the, all of the very, like the things that we need to understand and know about how, you know, our bodies need to be respected, et cetera, et cetera. It need to be brought up with those individuals. I think one of the pitfalls that I saw, um, specifically when I was working with folks with ID was that usually parents, um, or caretakers really didn't want to agree or talk about the fact that their loved one was capable of a sexual relationship or had any part of their body or mind that was interested in that because their understanding of their loved one was that they were always going to be, I mean, it was very infantilizing, right? Um, and so even though folks' understanding may be different, that doesn't mean that they aren't allowed to have a sexual relationship. You really just have to navigate it with them in a way that is understood. I think that's something that is super, super important with anyone, but especially with folks who, who have ID, um, is really checking for understanding, right? So are you understanding what I'm saying? Does this make sense to you? How does this feel to you? That type of thing. And being open and understanding, like if they're saying, no, that doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, like let's go back and let's figure out what it is that you need to help this make sense. Right. So I'm hearing that it's really individual. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Right. Yeah. And that makes a lot of, a lot, a lot of sense. Can I ask, so one of the things that um, I know you and I have talked about a ton is about how um, ComSex Ed from a young age, and, and we've mentioned it throughout here, keeps uh, young folks safe um, mm -hmm. because they have the right terms to let someone know um, that something is going on or um, they, they understand that they're the only ones who are allowed to set boundaries for their body, those kinds of things. Has that lens ever, did that ever help with some of the parents in that um, situation? Some. Because, like, I know that you're not thrilled with the idea that your your kid has a sexuality that they want to experience right. and what we're also doing here is keeping your kids safe yeah so in the capacity in which i worked i didn't have a lot of that con that, that contact with parents um so i can't say from personal experience that you know to answer the question directly like i could i can't say like yes i had a conversation once and it was helpful um so that wasn't necessarily the experience that i was having However, theoretically, I agree with you completely, right? Um, I think the thing that you and I have talked about quite a bit um, is when we use the euphemisms, right, mm -hmm. for, um, for body parts specifically, right? So you hear a lot of those. You hear a lot of nicknames and euphemisms for the vulva, the vagina, the penis, the scrotum, like all of those things, right? There are like a plethora of words <laughs> that we've come up with as, as a society so we don't have to say the dreaded vulva. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's, it has a place and it's fine. However, when we're talking about small children, right, using the words that everyone understands, right, so that is the, the scientific technical terms, vulva, penis, vagina, scrotum, anus, whatever, it, whatever, right? <laughs> Um, is really important because everybody has different slang, 
And everybody has different euphemisms. So if you teach your little one that their vulva, for instance, is their cookie, right? I've heard that before. Um, there are a lot of people who don't understand that euphemism. I'll tell you honestly, if somebody says to me like cookie, I'm, I'm thinking of snickerdoodles. Like, <laughs> can I have one? <laughs> right. Which is wholly inappropriate if we're talking about a euphemism. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, people don't necessarily understand what the euphemisms and slang terms are that are normal to your family, right? And that's why scientific terms are so important because you can have a situation as awful as it is and sounds and is difficult to talk about. You have plenty of situations where you have kiddos who are experiencing violence, who are experiencing physical, sexual, mental, whatever, mm -hmm. um, violence and can't like even when they try to reach out to talk to a teacher or a coach or another family member or someone that they trust about what's going on with them, when they're using euphemisms because they've never been taught or don't know the correct terms, they're trying to reach out for help and they can't get it because that person doesn't understand what they're talking about. Um, and that creates an, an opening and a continued opening for not only violence, but also a lack of trust in their environment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that is so perfectly put. And I, I also want to add, um, I think sometimes when people hear us say this, they, they sometimes will think, well, I can use like private parts still, right? Um, and, and I do want to address that because I think sometimes that can be helpful. Mm -hmm. And I will say that it does still send the message to young kids that their bodies are something that they don't ever talk about. Mm -hmm. And that what abusers are really, really good at using mm -hmm. that language and being like, this is private parts. So this is our private thing. And you can't tell anyone about this. This, this is, is our secret between you and I, and people will understand if, um, the kind of like the very classic manipulative yeah. abuser tactics of mm -hmm. using common language to their advantage. Mm -hmm. So I do want to address that because I think sometimes people are like, well, private part is like really clear. Right. But I think that there's still that implicit, um, message that we're sending to kids is that bodies are shameful when really bodies are bodies um, and you get to decide the terms of what happens to your body. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, private parts even still, like it's clear-ish, I would say, right? Because that could apply to a lot of things. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> I mean, like, if you think about a, you know, uh, genetically female body, like that's one, two, three, four, five or six different like particular parts of the body then you're just like okay I'm gonna need you to be more specific right. um, yeah. and I think additionally right when we use things like private parts or euphemisms I just remember you know when I used to teach for the military <clears throat> I would go I would go in and I'm talking like eight o'clock in the morning seven o'clock in the morning because these people don't believe in sleeping in which is very sad um, <laughs> like I would go in and I would be talking about like what are like touching what areas is, indicate sexual violence, like very specifically, like what are the definitions here? Um, and I would, we were taught to say like swimsuit areas. And I realized that like, that doesn't get, get there. Cause you, then you have like different styles of swimsuits, right? <laughs> so I'd be sitting there in a room with all adults, right? And I would say, okay, like the parts of the body that if somebody touches them without your consent, are you know sexual violence or sexual assault you know your breasts your vulva your penis your your butt like those types of, and i have like roomfuls of thousands of sailors that are like and i'm like yo yeah you're 25 uh, <laughs> like, which is funny but also completely hinders any kind of learning right we're trying to have an, a grown-up adult conversation about consent and sexual violence and how do we like keep this from happening or, or stop it from happening. And I've lost half my audience to penis. <laughs> right, and I'm sure the gender dynamics of uh, military life or uh, Marine life, I, I don't know much about the military, it'll be completely <laughs> Um <laughs> Military life was good. <laughs> um, the gendered um, aspects of that affected quite a bit as well, I imagine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Awesome. So I also want to ask, you know, um, cause we're kind of getting to the end of our conversation and I, I want to ask like, what are some small ways that you build in some of the things we've been talking about with your own child, Abigail? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One. 
Uh, yes, she did. I can't believe it, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so Abigail, for those of you who, who don't know, uh, is my child. She is um, one and three months, four months about now, amazingly, somehow. Um, and this is a conversation that I have with her on a regular basis. People sometimes look at me kind of sideways <laughs> when I say, you know, yeah, I absolutely talk about comprehensive sex ed or I talk about sex ed with my baby right? Because they're like, what are you doing, you terrible person? <laughs> um, I'm not talking about sex. I don't talk about sexual intercourse. It is not like appropriate on any level. What I do talk about with her are sort of four basic things that really do that building that we were talking about before, right? So the first thing is, is I teach her those appropriate names, right? It is very common and it is normal in exploration of their body. The same way that I remember when she discovered her ears and like wouldn't stop playing with them. Um, they discover different parts of their bodies and her vulva, so she happens, she just has a vagina. Um, she will reach down and she'll touch it or she'll play with it or whatever when we're changing diaper, which is fine. Um, and so I'll say to her very specifically, like, that's your vulva, Abigail. Um, and she'll look at me and like, she may touch it more. And I say, does that feel good? That's okay. Like, good job. I need you to move your hand now. Cause I gotta, you know, put a diaper on. <laughs> right. It's not a lengthy conversation about like, does that feel good? This is called masturbation. Like we're not having that conversation, but teaching her, this is what this body part is called in the same way that I teach her that this is her nose and these are her ears and these are her shoulders, um, helps to build that, right? So that one, these aren't names that she's never heard before and they don't cause embarrassment. Two, I'm not shaming her for touching her own body because she's 100% allowed to do that. Um, and at that age, which I think a lot of people absolutely. realize uh, that oh. when you're an infant, there's a lot, actually a lot of self-touching going on. There's a lot. Right. I know a lot of parents, especially parents with children with penises, like freak out about the fact that their their child is touching their penis or seems to be doing some kind of masturbatory motion. And they're really not. Right. It's it's not going to come to anything. They're they're touching and they're learning and they're feeling and they're trying to figure out like what feels good and what doesn't the same way that like if I scratch an itch like oh, that feels good. Like, cool. I'm going to move on now and <laughs> play with my cars. Right. Whatever. But what's interesting is in those situations, right, you have a kiddo who's doing something that's very natural and very normal, and then you have a parent who's freaking out, <laughs> right? And what that does is that teaches the child without actually any context or understanding, something I'm doing is wrong. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't be doing this because mommy and daddy don't act like that unless I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing, right? Because mm -hmm. often you'll see the same face when they're touching themselves as you see like, Abigail was shaking a lamp yesterday and Kevin and I had to like converge on her because we were so terrified she was going to hurt herself. It's without the running. It's the same thing, right? Though I suppose sometimes it could include the running. Um, people don't, when we react, they notice and they pay attention and that's what shapes their behavior, right? So it's really sad to me when I see parents who don't, who are afraid because they don't understand, right? I don't think this is intentional. I think it's that it's just not spoken about that this is normal for their kiddo to be doing. Um, and then you see this shame, like get put on the kiddo. Um, and then they carry that, right? Um, and not in necessarily like you freaked out once and now they have to go to therapy. Um, but like the continual this is bad. I shouldn't be doing this. I, we're not going to talk about this thing. Like I want to explore this part of my body, but I don't want anyone to know because it's scary. Not because like, this is a private thing that I do in my bedroom, which is reasonable and appropriate. Cool. Right. So one of the things I tell parents, um, or friends when they're open to it about, you know, their kiddos touching themselves and things like that is more like name what they're doing. And, um, sorry, name what they're doing and then helping them understand like where this should happen. So that's one thing. Um, we also talk a lot about boundaries. Um, so what are you, you know, do you want to give me a hug? No, not really. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> right. Um, and she doesn't have the words to tell me no necessarily at this moment, which, you know, in a lot of ways is nice because <laughs> I know the first thing she, the first time she learns, no, it's all I'm going to hear. But, um, <laughs> you know, this morning I was putting on her socks and I said, Abigail, can I have a hug? And she kept looking away from me and pointing at something else, which is her saying like, no, not really, not right now. Cause when she does, she hugs me. Right. Um, and we also talk about consent, right? That's 
bound into that same conversation. Are you consenting to this? Or are you not? You have the right as a person with a body to say whether or not you want someone to touch it as long as, and this is the really a key point here because it's a sticking point for parents of kiddos, as long as it's not, I don't need to do something for your health or safety, right? I need to, I need to change your diaper. <laughs> I need to wash your body in the bathtub. I'll tell you what I'm doing and I'll ask first, but we're, we got, we got to wash all the parts. That's going to happen. Yeah. Um, but if you don't want to hug me, you don't want to kiss me, you don't want to hug grandma or you don't want to give a kiss to Pappy, like, okay, that's fine. You don't have to do any of those things. That's okay. Um, and setting up that stage and then also, you know, guarding it for her because a lot of older adults specifically don't understand when they're like, oh, Abigail, come give auntie a hug. And she's like, mm. and then you as the parent, I as the parent have, have to be able to say like, she doesn't want you right now and that's okay. Um, cause they don't necessarily understand. And then the last thing that we talk a lot about is diversity, right? So I try to be very intentional with the language that I use with her to really steer away from any kind of transphobia, right? So we talk about people with vaginas or people with penises, and we don't link those things with gender identities, right? Because, you know, sometimes you'll hear, especially in those like very early conversations, like this is a girl, a girl has a vagina, and this is a boy, a boy has a penis, and that's not true, <laughs> right? Um, so talking about like, this is a person with a penis, that's different from what you have. They might identify as a girl or a boy, or they might not identify as neither. We don't really know. And it has nothing to do with that. <laughs> like right. it is, it's a complicated conversation, but in all actuality, it's not. Oh, right. Because yeah. if you start from the beginning, then you don't have to deconstruct anything. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, Honestly, my niece seems to take on, my niece is three, and she takes on a lot of those concepts uh, a lot faster, I think, than most adults. Uh, yeah. Her Julian is a Mermaid, which is a really great um, book, a uh, children's book about a young... Um, Can you a say young, that title again? Julian is a Mermaid. Okay. Um, so the child Julian is trans, and it sort of takes kids through that journey and sort of um, allowing them to have some of the language um, and also it, applying some like magic to that too and, and sort of like looking at how like awesome and, and sacred and magical um, someone's gender identity journey can be um, for mm -hmm. and, and putting that in the lens of a child's mind uh, mm -hmm. and it, it can be that easy right <laughs> it's yeah. like here's a helpful children's book that is going to help your child understand gender it doesn't yeah. always have to be like I only understand this from an academic viewpoint. And so how do I break down the gender binary for my infant? <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> there are charts and PowerPoints. Right. <laughs> like you said, they're a blank slate. Like they haven't been inundated with all of this um, very binarist uh, system mm -hmm. nonsense that we've all grown up with. Right. One of my favorite books that Abigail has um, specifically speaking to diversity is, um, I can't remember the name of it, but it's like, this is a family, something very basic like that. And it's all animals, right? Cause it's a kid's book. Right. But it's like, some people have a mommy and a daddy. Some people have two daddies. Some people have a mommy. Some people live with their grandparents. Like it's all these different things. And it's explaining family in this like very broad way. So like, not only are we talking about sexual and gender diversity, but we're also talking about relational diversity. Right. And that that's completely normal and that that's still a family. And I think that the book ends with like, as long as you're surrounded by people who love and care about you, that's a family, mm -hmm. which I think is really powerful, especially when you talk about the LGBT community. Um, and we start talking about things like chosen family. Absolutely. Right. Like that's a very real, very honest, very genuine thing. Um, and wanting her to know and understand diversity and what that looks like. And you know, that everyone deserves love and respect and everybody deserves to have their, their boundaries respected, um, including her. I just think that's really important. And I think that that will, that will help her mm -hmm. as we, you know, as she gets older. Um, I think something that a point that I really, I want to make just real fast is, um, some folks have asked me sometimes, you know, they know that, um, uh, I care very deeply about gender diversity and, and all these different things. And then they'll call me out like they think they're getting me, which is weird, um, on the fact that I use she, her pronouns for her. Um, 
And a conversation that my partner and I had um, was utilizing, you know, she, her while she's little um, because we didn't want to confuse her because that's what most people would probably use for her given her name is very, is gendered. Um, and so, um, we decided to do that, but we are always talking about, you know, if she decides one day, like, no, I really want to use they, or I want to use he, or I want to use something else, Mm -hmm. then it's our responsibility to, to pivot. Right. She is a guess. (laughs) <laughs> right? We're guessing how she identifies based on characteristics and personality and, and that's it. That's all we've got. Right. So until such time as she can tell us, we, we go with that. And then if she changes her mind or not even changes her mind, once she gets the ability to communicate what, you know, she wants to go by and what her reality is, then it's our responsibility to, you know, respect that and honor that and shepherd her through our life. It's not our job to shape her. It's our job to help her shape herself. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I really um, appreciate that point about diversity just because, and overall, um, with a lot of these conversations is that we know that there are as many people as there are, are as many possible expressions of sexuality. Um, and, and that's in the like actual feeling of sexuality and the engagement. So like there's, there's no like, here's it, here's sexuality, we've got it figured out (laughs) changing and it's going to change throughout our lifetimes and um onwards and it's changed throughout history so um thank you so much megan i so i want to be conscious of time um and you know i thank you so much for hopping on to our first episode of the phoenix cast we are so so excited to be debuting this and um thank you again megan um for being here so a couple points before we log off please know that the phoenix center remains open um to quickly reach us please call 303-556-2255 which is our um, 24-7 helpline where you can set an appointment and also immediately talk to an advocate. Um, in addition to that, please stay tuned for our, for our, for our um, next few episodes, which are going to be focusing around a few different <laughs> things, <Backwards. laughs> which will be focusing on a few different topics such as Tiger King. Um, we're going to split that into two episodes. Um, we'll also be breaking down um, Unbelievable and you know, kind of talking through how that's a helpful series and as well as unorthodox. There's going to be quite a bit of media deconstruction um, about shows that are doing it right and shows that aren't doing it right. And then what are the more complicated nuanced pieces where we're not sure if this is right, but it's a conversation that needs to happen. Um, And so we're here to talk about it and make sure that we're getting as as deep into the content as we possibly can, even on the go, even with everything going on. And then on that note, Um, with everything going on with the stay at home order here in Colorado. Um, Please everyone take care of yourself um, and be kind uh, to yourself. We certainly don't have it figured out and we don't expect that anyone listening to this has it figured out. There's no rule book. Um, Mm. The only rule book is surviving the next few months. Agreed. Um, Stay home, be kind to yourself and everyone else. Yeah. Bye. Bye.